Hi there guys, got a video here for you today on the FXM3 and what we're going to be doing in this one is making a new trigger blade for the rifle. The standard trigger blade that comes with the M3 is a fairly simple design, it's just a shaped shoe with a grub screw in the side to secure it to the pole. We're going to be making one with a slightly different design but you'll see what we do as we walk through the build. First thing to do is get over to the lathe and start preparing some stock. We're going to be holding the stock in the mill via the use of a four-sided collet block, so we need to prepare both ends of the stock. To do this, we're turning one end down to just under 13 millimeters, and this is the side that we'll be holding in both the lathe chuck and also the four-sided collet block when we move the part over to the mill. But once we've got it turned down to diameter, we can flip the piece in the chuck and start working on the trigger shoe itself. First thing to do is turn the OD, so this is 16mm stock, and we just need to turn it so it's round. So I'm taking it down to 15.5mm. Once that's done, we can drill through the centre of the material, and this will be the hole that locates on the trigger pole fitted to the rifle. So we're coming through with a 2.5mm drill bit first, and then opening it out to 3mm. Once that's been done, we're going to be putting a decorative knurl on the piece. The front of my trigger design is going to be knurled, so the part that you put your finger on will be knurled in the final trigger shoe, and all the other sides will be milled away. And to put the knurl on, we're just using a scissor style clamp knurling tool with a constant flow of cutting oil to keep the rollers clean. This process is a form process, meaning that it does generate a fair amount of heat, and if you're not careful, what will happen is the rollers will actually start embedding aluminium dust and debris back into the work. With that done, we can put a decorative chamfer on both ends. As you, we do this, you may notice that we're touching off the side of the tool onto the work. This is the easiest way to get an accurate location of the tool in relation to the work. This particular tool is 16mm in width, so what we do is we touch one end on the face of the work, feed in 8mm which is half of the width of the tool, zero out the DRO and we know exactly where the tool is in relation to the work. What this means in very simple terms is that we'll have the same size chamfer on both sides of the trigger shoe. And to finish the knurl off we're coming through with some green scotch bright just to take the sharp edges off. Next up we can move the part over to the vise and as you can see there, we've got it set up in the four-sided collet block, as well as having a vice stop set up in the back. This will just allow us to retain our X position as we take the piece in and out of the vice. The first thing to do is to locate the piece in the vice using an edge finder. To use one of these devices, we're just coming through and touching the tool on the side of the material, feeding in until we see the edge finder wobble off of center, and then zeroing out our position. When we have one side located, we can move to the other side of the work and do the same on the other side. Although instead of zeroing out our position this time, we just use the half function on the DRO. This will put our Y0 position in the center of the workpiece. With that done, we can move over to the exposed end of the work and locate the X position. Again, just touching the tool on the work, feeding in until we see the edge finder wobble off the center, and then zeroing out our position. As we're not using the half function in this application, we do have to compensate for the diameter of the tool. So once we've got our zero position, we have to feed in half the diameter of the tool, in this case, three millimeters, and that gets the center line of the spindle on the very outer edge of the work. With our position successfully found, we can move on to the first operation, which is going to be taking the trigger down to width. Firstly, touching the end mill off on the top of the material, feeding down 3.5mm and then removing that material from one side. Once it's been removed, we can loosen the vise, rotating the piece 180 degrees in the vise, tightening everything back up and then taking the same amount of material off from this side. With this done, we can take our calibers, measure across the material and calculate how much material we have left to remove from each side. The goal is 8mm, and as you can see from the calipers there, we hit 8.02mm, which is slightly oversized, but perfectly good for a trigger blade. With that done, we can move on to the next operation, which is going to be surrounding the locking screw. We're going to be doing this slightly different, as I don't like the idea of having a very small grub screw in the side of the trigger. What we're going to be using is the side of a countersunk bolt. You'll see what I mean as we progress through. First thing to do though is to use a stub drill and just spot the hole location. Next we can come through with a 2.5mm drill bit 
which is tap in size for M3. With the hole located, we can come back with a 6mm end mill and counterbore the hole for the head of the screw. The screw position is slightly offset from the trigger pole position, and when the screw is installed and everything's said and done, as we tighten up the countersunk screw, the head will clamp onto the trigger pole to stop it from rotating. With that all done though, the next operation is to drill some more holes. Now I'm going to be leaving the purpose of these holes as a mystery until the end of the video, but feel free to guess what you think these holes will be used for when the trigger blade is complete. But the first thing to do is to spot drill the holes, two on either side of the securing screw, and then come back with a 2mm drill bit, drilling straight through the material. With the mystery holes done, the next thing to do is to mill the trigger to depth. So we're using a 6mm 2 fluted carbide end mill to mill the back of the trigger out. The depth of the trigger we're aiming for is 10mm, and as you can see from the calipers there, we hit it pretty darn close. Next thing we can do is mill out some of the waste material from the ears of the trigger. This will allow the trigger to slide up and down the pole without hitting any of the larger features on the trigger pole. Again, just using our 6mm end mill to mill out the waste material. In the process of this, we do expose the backs of the mystery holes, and this will hopefully give you a little hint as to the use of these holes. With the waste material removed, we can come back through with a countersink and countersink this side of the mystery holes. And again, making good use of the four-sided collet block as we flip the part, reverse our coordinates and countersink the other side of the holes nice and successfully. And finally, finishing out on this side by chamfering the M3 hole. Once that's been done, we can flip the part 90 degrees and chamfer the front of the trigger blade. There's a few decorative chamfers to put on, but the first one we're doing is the front of the work. With the front done, we can again make good use of the collet block and flip the part 180 degrees so that we can access the back side. On this side, we're just going to be putting the chamfer on the raised section you see there. As this is a square, it's nice and easy to ensure that all chamfers are the same depth, as we can record the offset used for each of the directions and mirror it so that we get all the chamfers nice and even. As we go through, you will notice a small amount of deflection in the work as we chamfer the part, but luckily, as these are just decorative chamfers, it doesn't really matter that much. And on close inspection of the part, the deflection didn't seem to create any problems with the chamfers. With that done, the trigger can be separated from the stock. I just did this off camera by sawing it off. The part can then be put back in the mill and the end cleaned up using our end mill. And then finally, to finish off the part, a decorative chamfer can be put on either end. And that's about it. That's the part fully complete. And this is what the part looks like when it's been deburred and washed. The next stage is to bead blast the part. So we put the part in our bead blasting cabinet give it a good even bead blasting on either side using some glass media. Next the part can be anodized and dyed black and as you can see there the securing screw has been installed and finally the purpose of the mystery holes can be revealed. The holes are used as channels to secure some o-rings to the trigger blade itself. The o-rings just help with finger position and just act as a guide so that you can get your finger in exactly the same position each and every time you go to pull the trigger. If I'm honest, more of a novelty rather than a required feature, but I saw a similar idea on a very expensive MEK trigger, so I wanted to emulate that. And after using the trigger for a little while, the O-rings did prove quite useful. But that's about going to do it for this video, guys. So hopefully you've enjoyed that little demonstration of how we made the new trigger for our M3 and we'll see you in the next one.